Welcome to the BizOps Manifesto Power Panel, talking about embracing agility across the business. I'm Lisa Martin. I have three guests here with me today to break down this topic. Pierre Filyun, CTO and Global Head of Enterprise Technology and Governance at HCL Enterprise Studio. Hey, Pierre, welcome. Dave West is also here, the CEO of scrum.org. Hey, Dave, good to have you with us. Hi, Lisa. Hi, everybody. And Serge Lucio is here as well, the General Manager of Broadcom's Enterprise Software Division. Hey, Serge, good to have you on the program. Thank you. Good to be here. So we're going to be talking about the people and the process and technology requirements that businesses need to adopt to be able to embrace agility across the business. We're going to also be talking a lot about this inaugural BizOps industry research survey on the state of digital business. A lot of very interesting findings that we're going to go through the next 20 minutes or so. So the first question guys is the BizOps survey found is over 519 individuals over five countries, business and technology executives this survey found most organizations still expect this year to be as challenging as last year. I want you to kind of walk us through why that is and how is that going to impact digital transformation initiatives? Pierre, we'll start with you, then Dave, then Serge. Sure, no, thank you, Lisa. So uh, I think these days disruption is no longer an exception. It's kind of become the norm or the rule in terms of how we operate. And as uh, executives in companies have learned, you know, over the last year with everything that's happened is that you can only modernize to a point and then you need to do a little bit more. And what really is needed is for us to understand going forward how we're actually going to remodel our business by harnessing the resources that we have in a much more agile way, in a more fluent way from an organizational perspective. And I think our current you know, midterm goals probably is that we're capable of remodeling how we can remove roadblocks, these kind of roadblocks in the future and get us in a better position where we are. I don't expect things to change dramatically over the next year, more in line with us making sure that we're more future-proof in the way in which we're working. We still have remote workers, global uncertainty, the vaccine. Dave, what are your thoughts on the impact of this year on trans digital transformation initiatives? Yeah, it, it's funny. When I think of um, sort of uncertainty and chaos, I think that uh, that COVID really started it rolling down a hill. But unfortunately, it's literally like rolling down a hill, this chaos and complexity. It's getting faster and faster and harder and harder. You know, we're talking about the new norm, right? What is the new normal? We just don't know. And I think the reality is that most organizations were surprised by the impact of COVID-19. And because of that, they responded very quickly. Many of them, you know, people were working at home, changing, looking at their supply chain, looking at localization, you know, all sorts of really important things happen, but very quickly, not very strategically. I think the next few years, we're going to see hopefully some of that realizing into strategy and being, you know, and actually starting to fundamentally change how the businesses look at the world. We've sort of entered the digital age, Lisa, you know, this next age of innovation. We're moved out of mass production and the age of oil into something very, very different. And I think those organizations, every organization out there is going to have to get a handle on that. And COVID was the wake up, right? And uh, I think the next five years are going to be very interesting. I, I agree with you that that accelerant was, I didn't think of it before as a big ball rolling downhill. Now I don't think I'm going to be able to get that out of my head. But Serge, talk to us about your thoughts, the impacts to digital transformation initiatives. Yeah, I think back to what Dave was, was describing, right? So the, the big challenge is the uncertainty. Um, many, many organizations are faced with uh, kind of a lot of unknowns about if and when things will go back to quote unquote some kind of normality. And, and, and with that kind of uncertainty, um, it, there's a lot of challenge in terms of planning from an investment point of view. Content. So Dave was talking about kind of uh, short-term versus long-term. Like a lot of these organizations are basically focused on just uh, getting by over the next 12 months and, and trying to figure out what needs to happen over the next 12 months. At the same time, there's a lot of uh, challenges with respect to you know, re revenue uncertainty. And so in, in that context, you have kind of this tension between how much do I invest short term on basically tactical initiatives? How do I feel about teams? How do we enable these teams to deliver in weeks as opposed to months? And then at the same time, how do I start to, how do I continue to invest 
to fundamentally change kind of my operating model. And, and that, that tension is very real between uh, many of the organizations we serve. One of the things that the survey found was that most of the respondents were very willing to embrace being more agile in order to be able to better respond to rapidly changing market conditions. But I wanna get your opinion on what that actually really means, that willingness to embrace being agile. What does it really mean? And what do organiz organizations have to do differently? Pierre, we'll start with you. Yeah, sure. So I think we had a discussion a while back and, and Dave actually coined something interesting where he said, you know, People without, you know, quoting a famous you know, sneaker brand, just go out and do it. I think that's probably the most important part of this. I mean, most organizations are struggling to figure out how should we embrace agile? Should we jump in at full scale? No. Should we be looking scrum? Should we be doing scrum fall? Should we be falling over our own feet? Nobody knows exactly, you know, what might be the right fit. And I think the most important part is to pick a, a pair of solid principles that you're going to embrace start executing on them, start learning as you go, and basically improve as you move forward. I mean, over the last year, we've embraced digital product management um, quite a lot on our side, and it's had a tremendous benefits without us per se aiming for those benefits at the end of the day. And these are things that you learn as you go. And if you're going to wait around, you know, analysis paralysis is going to be the killer of agile at the end of the day. Just do it. I like that good advice. Dave, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think that what's really interesting is Agile has been around for 20 years. The manifesto was signed 20 years ago. Scrum came into the world 25 years ago. All of these sort of Agile approaches, but they were predominantly focused on technology. And I think that one thing that I've noticed over and over again is that the realization by C-level executives, level sevens or whatever they're called, um, they've realized that it's not about technology. <laughs> I mean, it's great that the technologists, I guess the technologists always worked in this complex world because customers never knew what they wanted. We didn't know how we we're going to do it. We'd never worked together before. We didn't know how much it was going to cost. So <laughs> because of that, we had to work in an agile way in technology. But ultimately, I think one of the big differences going forward is going to be that, um, dare I say, that intersection of business and technology, that business ops kind of model that we that we talked about in the, in the manifesto and what the survey was really trying to tease out i think that's really really going to be interesting and i don't know what that actually means in terms of the execution i hope it means that we're going to see teams better aligned to business outcomes I hope it's going i hope it means that we're going to actually allow those teams that are actually know what they're approaching to make decisions. I hope it means that planning is going to be more directional rather than, you know, task level. I hope it means that we're going to start measuring the success in terms of business outcomes, not in terms of the work that we do. I, I hope it means all of these things, but we will wait and see because experience would indicate that after a big disaster, lots of people tend to go back to exactly how they worked before, you know, with that sort of emu kind of mentality or ostrich or whatever thing sticks its head in the ground. I don't, I don't know. Well, sometimes we just we would just want to go back to when things were safe and normal. But in terms of kind of following on, Dave, to what you said, 94% in the survey, 94% of respondents said we should adopt BizOps to increase competitiveness. So that willingness is there in a vast majority of the respondents. But so I'd like to get your thoughts on what that willingness actually means and what they need to do differently. Yeah, so the problem is that I think everybody understands that uh, you have to be agile, right? You need to be able to respond quickly to your, to your customer needs. You need to put the customer at the center of everything you do, right? So conceptually, I think everybody understands that. The, the problem is really the operating model that many of these large organizations are, are dealing with to this day, right? So you have these kind of vertically kind of organized kind of organization, you know, with, uh, with functional roles, specialized roles. And when you think about kind of agility, uh, well, one of the big challenges is that you, you need to start to think horizontally, right? You need to start to think about kind of value streams and what part of the cross-functional teams that need to be organized um, and, and integrated to deliver on specific business outcomes. You need to start shifting from the traditional contract-based model that these teams have historically uh, to a model which is much more based on trust, right? And you need to move away from kind of vanity, vanity metrics and KPIs that many of the organizations 
typically lead by, uh, to really focus on one thing and one thing only, which is kind of the business value that's being delivered. So fundamentally, I think it, it, it requires a bit of a, a redesign of the operating model within these organizations. And, and one where, um, you know, especially when you have risk adverse um, kind of organizations, you need to start to be more accepting of risk uh, fundamentally. More accepting of risk. You brought something up there, sir, that I want to tackle in the next question with respect to culture. But one of the things that the survey uncovered was an interesting kind of seeming contradiction. Uh, the majority of respondents said, we agree digital transformation is about business outcomes more than it is about technology. But 62% said we're still adopting technology for technology's sake. What does that actually mean? And what's the kind of cultural impact there for organizations to really get that more uh, aligned on di the digital transformation and the technology and the business outcomes? So, uh, uh, Pierre, we'll start with you. Sure. So I think there were a number of reports this year, you know, talking about what's happened, what's not happened. And the majority of them focus on the fact that, you know, as tech leaders, for years we've been, you know, praying to the gods to get budget approval to do all kinds of modernization activities to our infrastructure, our IT, you know, tools, et cetera. And, you know, lo and behold, the ball comes rolling down the hill, um, smashes a few things, and we basically get some blank checks. So we run around and we buy a whole bunch of stuff to modernize and to, you know, embrace this ability to do things differently. And in that whole process, what we basically did was buy more tools and buy more technology. And in that whole process, we didn't really embrace what it is that we we're trying to achieve. So basically aligning the technology to the actual business requirements, getting closer to the customer, being able to understand where our market's moving, how we're capable of you know, reducing the, the journey, if I can put it that way, and make sure that we're more aligned to, to where we need to be. So, you know, Although a lot of CIOs and CTOs got away with doing a lot of great stuff over the last year, and you know, users like me are like, woohoo, I don't have to worry about stupid VPNs and things anymore. You know, that all went away. But in the same instance, I didn't really get anything that changed the organizational dynamic, um, which is a challenge. We still have the fundamental problems we have because the business leaders are not yet embracing the deep knowledge of the processes that are supported by the technology and then driving that in such a way that we can gain more business value, which is important, you know, to Serge's previous point, you know, we're doing all these great things, but we're not focusing on the incremental value that we're supposed supposed to be, you know, getting. Dave, did it surprise you that there was this seemingly contradictory response? Yes, it's more about biz outcomes than technology, but we're still adopting technology for technology's sake. What are your thoughts on that? And how can organizations actually start to move the needle on that? You can't buy cultural change, right? But you do know that your board and your leadership want you to do something. And the easiest thing you can do is buy something. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a sort of now an American. So that's kind of my mantra in life, right? When in doubt, go shopping. And, uh, and which is fantastic, just, just for the record. <laughs> but so the, you, you've got to be seen to be doing something, whether it's replacing a VPN, um, which is always a fun thing to do, or whether it's getting on Slack. Everybody's going to be on Slack. That's going to help. But actually, the, the core is that exactly what Serge and Pierre have been saying all along. It's that, OK, so what is our business all about? Where is our, what are our customers? What do they actually need? What do our employees need? How do we build a better value stream from customer to, to, um, to the organization? How do we align our teams to that? How do we incentivize correctly the, both the employees that are working and our partners that are providing things in this supply chain? How do we do all of those things? I mean, ultimately, though, that means that we have to take a step back, which is a very frustrating thing at the moment, and actually look at what is our business all about? What is the mission of it? Who are the customers? Take a moment to find what those are. And then as soon as we have that, and we don't have to do it, as, as Pierre said, we don't have to do it completely. We can do it incrementally organizations are very inward looking. That is the industrial mindset. That is that paradigm. It's looking as Serge talked about silos, optimizing my department, optimizing my budget, optimizing my, my kingdom. And what we're talking about is something that cross cuts all of that. 
So the decision making is going to change around where the investments go, and 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 that's that's going to be really really challenging. So I'm not surprised. I'm not at all surprised that. But everybody says we should be doing this, and it's like classic, you know. I mean, everybody says we need to be fitter, but we're still all not fit. You know, <laughs> it's sort of that's just the reality of the world that we live in, right? But we have to start making a stand, and the place we begin is customers. That's the place, and and as soon as we start doing that, then everything else just becomes quite easy, actually. I like that. Focus on customers, and it becomes easy. Serge, I'm I'm kidding. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think they they summarize it well, right? It's it's, it's very easy to just uh, buy a tool or, or buy something, right? Uh, fundamentally, changing kind of an operating model is very difficult, right? You you need to fundamentally rethink, for instance, all the fund initiatives. So something as mundane as you know, all you know, as a leader, right? In my organization, I have a budget, right? What's my incentive of uh, of collaborating with my peers? In, in, in terms of delivering kind of an outcome. And, um, and so that, that to me is kind of a fundamental shift that we need to operate. And, and that's probably one of the reasons why many of the, our, our largest organizations that we're serving are, are starting to introduce kind of new roles, like a chief digital officer. That's kind of a way to, to kind of bring kind of a, a, a slightly different organizational design. Uh, the challenge though is that, well, all of these teams are still kind of integrated with the fabric of these large kind of systems, which you know exist. So when we look at kind of uh, these value streams, in fact, they are they're not kind of independent from one another. You have a bunch of interdependencies. You are looking at kind of networks of these value streams. Um, but the 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 fundamental shift that we need to see is is really for these organizations to think about ultimately what part of the products or services that uh, need to be focused on. All these become kind of the, the primary things that we measure from a KPI point of view. And how do we align teams and projects and funding uh, along these kind of outcomes? So being customer focused, also being more broadly focused, you mentioned the chief digital officer role, which is an interesting role. One that looks is supposed to look more holistically uh, internally and externally. And we know that, that these organizations know we need to be better at this. Like Dave's joke about, we know we need to be more fit, but what's it going to take to actually create that collaboration so that IT and business leaders are really working in lockstep and doing so in a, in a timely fashion so that they're able to stay competitive. And I, I do want to know from each of you, are you seeing examples of this already in progress? Pierre, let's start with you. Yeah, so I mean, I, I can only give an inward example and say, you know, one of the interesting things that we did was we we tried to embrace the delivery of services at HL in kind of a different frame this year and kind of productize the services that we deliver. Now, if, if you're most people, you're trying to think about how do I set up, you know, things like communities of practice and collaboration between people so that they can work together on developing new services, new features, new products, et cetera. And we set out with, you know, creating this agile way of way of working. What we didn't anticipate, which which was a, a very nice side effect, is that because of COVID, because of the catalyst that it provided us, the remote working, people sense of ownership is inherently there meaning that self-organization of teams started happening. Nobody needed to crack a whip to get a bunch of guys to talk together with one another to figure out how to get stuff done. It's not like you can walk over to the water cooler and have a chat to Bob. You know, Bob is a thousand miles away or Bob is sitting in another state. So all of a sudden the whole dynamic changed. And I have to say, you know, people are a lot more resilient than what they're being given credit for. And if as organizations, we embrace the culture in such a way and harness it in a positive way, we can actually get this movement to happen. And we actually can make the sum of the parts to be more than the whole. And this year we've seen that happen. Um, and by no means are we done. We still have a lot of work to do, like Serge said, you know, yeah, we have budgets, you know, and budgets give you finite amount of movement left or right. And you have to do what's best and, and possible within the frame that you're given. But I, I think, you know, embracing the cultural change and helping people to really excel at that and empowering them makes a huge difference in the way that you can get stuff done. Absolutely. Dave, what are your thoughts on this? I, I'm going to say something a little bit controversial, I think. I'm not a big fan of chief digital officers. 
I'm not, it just seems like, well, we've got a problem. It's like, you know, and, and some would argue that, well, if you've got a problem with something, you should get a coach and all this stuff and you get it sorted. And that's probably a good thing. But most digital officers, their entire, they're going to build a long-term career in that and, and create yet another stovepipe. And that stovepipe's responsible for bringing all the other stovepipes together. It sounds a bit odd. If a digital officer is really there to, as a short-term enabler, because you asked, you asked me, you asked IT and business leaders, you know, trying to get them to work together better. The best business leaders know about IT, right? The best business leaders are IT centric. You know, Elon Musk isn't, you know, or or Jeff Bezos are great business leaders, but they know about technology, right? That's what brings them together. Technology is an asset. And they may not be the most biggest expert in it, but they care deeply about learning about that stuff. So I think I think the next few years, we're going to see a lot of C-level and, and, and leaders in organizations become a lot more tech savvy and maybe hire coaches to help them navigate. And the mm -hmm. chief digital officer will become more of a coach rather than a a person that rolls out Slack or, or something, you know? <laughs> so uh, I think that is going to be... The next, the next big jump, really, when we realize that it's not, you don't get an additional thing. It's just part of what you do, you know? Serge, agree, disagree? No, I, I agree. I mean, the, the, the reality is that it, it is happening, right? I mean, the, the, don't get me wrong. We see that every day that uh, some initiatives are, are highly integrated. Uh, organizations and teams are measuring business value, business outcomes. The problem is that it's oftentimes a very small subset of what these organizations are, are, are doing. And so it's, it's almost like the CEO is coming as kind of these new kind of, uh, as Dave described, as kind of this new silent organization, which is really there to kind of scale uh, what has been working within these organizations. But, but we're kind of creating this kind of almost shadow organization as opposed to fundamentally rethinking mm. uh, and redesigning the organization and redesigning kind of the operating model. Uh, and so we are kind of layering new stuff as opposed to fundamentally transforming. Uh, so as long as it is just a, kind of a, a, just a step towards kind of a true transformation, I think that's fine. The, the challenge is, is to, again, create kind of a, a new set of silos, which are now called value streams, as opposed to you know, functional silos that we have today. So a lot of opportunities identified in this survey, but there are still a lot of challenges there. So I'd love to get you guys and our final question here in this panel to help us understand from the BizOps Coalition's perspective, how are you helping organizations to navigate these challenges so that they can become successful, transform and actually become agile to respond to rapidly changing market conditions? Pierre, kick us off. Sure, so I mean, from a coalition perspective, you know, we're just trying to make sure that there's a set of sensible principles, you know, that people can can look at can adopt um, that you know I think Dave mentioned it in another discussion that give you that clarity of thought and mind you know in terms of what should you be be thinking how should you be thinking about it what are the the various aspects you need to consider and then from that perspective how does how do you implement these things in a sensible way for your organization you know by no means is this like here are the 10 steps you do them you know and you're done you know you'll be rich beyond your wildest dreams it's not how it works you know you're still gonna have to work at it you're still gonna have to figure some stuff out you're gonna have to deepen yourself in your organizational you know policies procedures understand how the organization's actually working i mean you can't strap a va to a to mini cooper and expect to break the land speed record without the wheels falling off you know or, or something going wrong so you really need to harness that in a more sensible manner you know to move forward and i think uh, the coalition is on the right path to help organizations realize you know what is a sensible way to go you know what are principles we can adopt that we can abide by that will help us you know drive business in a different way and close this chasm of disparity between you know business and IT. And Dave, your perspective on the BizOps Coalition helping organizations to sort through these challenges. Yeah, I've got to share a little bit of a personal story. So I I must admit that I wasn't keen on the whole idea. And Serge sent me some stuff and he's like, could you just provide some feedback? And I did and then there was a press release with my name on it. 
And that, so I was like, oh my God, I better get involved because I don't want to, you know, have my name associated with something that doesn't make sense. But I've actually been surprisingly, um, I've actually found it a lot more positive than I, I thought because of exactly what Pierre's saying. So basically the coalition is a, a group of vendors, a group of consultants, some pseudo thought leaders that think they are very thoughtful and maybe they're not people like me. <laughs> And what we're what we're doing though is actually trying to get some clarity of terminology, get some clarity of what 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 are the principles, what are those key principles, how do they relate to each other, get some some synergy to allow because there's so much noise out there, and hopefully this is going to say okay, this is what BizOps is, this is why it's important, these are some simple things, and then hopefully because of the breadth that, that Serge and others have managed to get in terms of of membership, we're going to get all of those organizations to be consistently talking about these things, which will then create pressure on the market to actually start adopting these things in the, in the way that we're proposing or challenge those ideas and then make them better. So I'm, I'm kind of excited about it, surprisingly, because the last thing we need is yet another manifesto and, and group of people that spend their whole time talking about things and never getting anything done. But actually, I think there might be some valuable stuff that comes out of here. And we're going to inspect and adapt to make sure it is valuable. And if it isn't, we will stop. <laughs> and so just wrap us up with, with your thoughts on and extending that value. Yeah, I mean, look, we we, we started the, the Peace Ops Manifesto really with kind of a very simple observation. Everybody's talking about the same stuff, right? But you have a value stream management church, the digital product management church, the DevOps church, the Scrum church, the Safe church, right? But we're all saying the same thing. But we create so much confusion with our large enterprise customers by just not agreeing on a set of principles and just saying, like, look, fundamentally, we're all talking about the same thing. And there are there are process aspects, there are cultural aspects, there is what do you measure, there's but but fundamentally, we agree on the same core set of principles. And so for me, uh, the BizOps Manifesto, first and foremost, is to get the stakeholders from these different communities together and recognize that at the end of the day, we share the same values and create some clarity to the market as to how these pieces fit to one another. The second aspect, which is more from our point of view as, a, as one of the vendors of tools, Right. There's tons of tools out there. We talked a lot about kind of measuring business outcomes as a primary way um, to actually align everybody in our organization. Well, today, if you look at any of these organizations, on average, they use about 40 different tools on one of these value streams. None of that stuff integrates with one another. It's extremely difficult for an organization to be able to trace from an investment all the way to stuff that delivers value in production to a customer. And so one of my hopes through the coalition is that we start to actually provide a platform, data models, ontologies to start to integrate those different tools to facilitate that kind of integration. So to, th those are kind of the two things which I think we can really help um, kind of develop and, and, and improve on. Well, we know that there's a tremendous amount of folks out there that are wanting to embrace agility across the business, identifying areas where they need to do work. So great advice from the three of you. Thank you so much for joining me on this power panel today and sharing what organizations can do to really embrace that agility across the organization. Thank you. Thank you. For Pierre Filioun, Dave West and Serge Lucio, I'm Lisa Martin. Thanks for watching. Welcome to this BizOps Manifesto Power Panel, Data Lake or Data Landfill. We're going to be talking about that today. I've got three guests joining me. We're going to dive through that. Karen Taylor is here, the CMO of Broadcom's Enterprise Software Division. Karen, great to have you on the program. Thank you, Lisa. Kevin Cerise is here as well, Chairman and CTO of AppVance. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Lisa. And Isaac Sokolik, author and CEO of Star.io. Isaac, welcome. Hi, Lisa, thanks for having me. So we're going to spend the next 25 to 30 minutes talking about the challenges 
and the opportunities that data brings to organizations. You guys are going to share some of your best practices for how organizations can actually sort through all this data to make data-driven decisions. We're also going to be citing some statistics from the inaugural BizOps industry survey of the state of digital business in which 519 business and technology folks were surveyed across five nations. Let's go ahead and jump right in. And the first one in that survey that I just mentioned, 97% of organizations say we've got data related challenges limiting the amount of information that we actually have available to the business. Big conundrum there. How do organizations get out of that conundrum? Kieran, we're going to start with you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if it's so much limiting information as it is limiting answers. Um, there's no real shortage of data, I don't think, being captured. Recently met with a uh, unnamed auto manufacturer who's collecting petabytes of data from their connected cars. And they're doing that because they don't really yet know what questions they have of the data. So I think you get out of this data landfill conundrum by first understanding what questions to ask. It's not algorithms, it's not analytics, it's not you know math that's going to solve this problem. It's really, really understanding your customers' issues and, and what questions to ask of the data. Understanding what questions to ask of the data. Kevin, what are your thoughts? Yeah, look, I, I think it gets uh, uh, down to uh, 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 what questions you want to ask and what you want out of it, right? Mm -hmm. So there's questions you want to ask, but what are the business outcomes you're looking for, which is the core of BizOps anyway, right? What are the business outcomes and what business outcomes uh, can I act upon? So there are so many business outcomes you can get from data and you go, well, I'm, I can't legally act upon that. I can't practically act upon that. I can't, whether it's lay off people or hire people or whatever it is, right? So what are the actionable items? There is plenty of data. We would argue too much data. Now we could say, is the data good? Is the data bad? Is it poorly organized? Is it, is it noisy? There's all other problems, right? There's plenty of data. What do I do with it? What can I do that's actionable? If I was an automaker and I had um, lots of sensors on the road, I had petabytes, as Karen says, and, I, and I'm probably bringing in petabytes potentially every day, well, I could make my self-driving systems better. That's an obvious place to start, right? That's what I would do, but I, I could also, potentially use that to change people's insurance and say, if you drive in a certain way, something we've never been able to do, if you drive in a certain way, based on the sensors, you get a lower insurance rate. Now, nobody's done that, but now there's interesting business opportunities for that data that you didn't have one minute ago and I just gave away. So, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's all about the actionable items in the data. How do you drive something to the top line and the bottom line? Because in the end, that's how we're all measured. And Isaac, I know you think data is the lifeblood. What are your thoughts on this conundrum? Well, I, I think they, you know, they gave you the start and the end of the equation. Start with a question. What are you really trying to answer? What you don't understand that you want to learn about your business, connect it to an outcome that is valuable to you. And really what most organizations struggle with is a process that goes through discovery, learning what's in the data, addressing data quality issues, loading new data sources if required, and really doing that iteratively. And we're all agile people here at BizOps. Right, so doing it iteratively, uh, getting some answers out, and understanding what the issues are with the underlying data, and then going back and revisiting and reprioritizing what you want to do next. Do you want to go look at another question? Is it heading? Is the answer heading down a, a path that you can drive outcomes? Um, do you got to go cleanse some data? So it's really that: how do you put it together so that you can peel the onion back and start looking at data and getting insights out of it? Great advice. Another challenge though that the survey identified was that nearly 70% of the respondents, and again, 519 business and technology professionals from five countries said, we are struggling to create business metrics from our data with so much data, so much that we can't access. Can you guys share best practices for how organizations would sort through and identify the best data sources from which they can identify the ideal business metrics? Kieran, take it away. Sure thing. I, I guess I'll build on Isaac's statements. Um, every every company has some gap in data, right? And so when you do that that data gap analysis, I think you really, I don't know, it's like Alice in Wonderland. Begin at the beginning, right? You start with that question, like Isaac said. And I think the best questions are really born from an understanding of what your customers value. 
Um, and if you dig into that and you understand what the customers value, you, you build it off of actual customer feedback, market research, then you know what questions to ask. And then from that, hey, what inputs do I need to really understand um, how to solve that particular business issue or problem? Kevin, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to add to that. Uh, uh, completely agree. But uh, 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 look, at, let's start with sales data, right? So sales data is something everybody on this, everybody watching this understands. Even if they're not in sales, they go, well, okay, I understand sales data. What's interesting there is we know who our customers are. Uh, we could probably figure out, if we have enough data, why they buy. Are they buying because of a certain salesperson? Are they buying because it's a certain region? Are they buying because of some demographic that we don't understand, but AI can pull out, right? So I would like to know who's buying and why they're buying. Because if I know that, I might make more of what more of those people want, whatever that is. Certain uh, fundamental sales changes or product changes or whatever it is. So if, if you could certainly start there. If you start nowhere else, say, I sell X today, I'd like to sell X times 1.2 by next year. Okay, great. Can I learn from the last five years of sales, millions of units or million, whatever it is, how to do that better? And the answer is for sure yes. And yes, there's problems with the data and there's holes in the data, as Karen said, and there's missing data. It doesn't matter. There's a lot of data around sales. So you could just start there and probably drive some top line growth just doing what you're already doing, but doing it better and learning how to do it better. Learning how to do it better. Isaac, uh, talk, talk to us about what your thoughts are here with respect to this challenge. Well, when you look at that percentage, 70% struggling with business metrics, you know, what I see is some companies struggling when they have too few metrics, you know, their KPIs, it really doesn't translate well to people doing work for a customer, for an application, responding to an issue. So when you have too few and they're too disconnected from the work, people don't understand how to use them. And then on the flip side, I see other organizations trying to create metrics around every single part of the operation, you know, dozens of different ways of measuring user experience and so forth. And that doesn't work because now we don't know what to prioritize. So I think the art of this is management coming back and saying, what are the metrics do we want to see impact and changes over in a short amount of time, over the next quarter, over the next six months, and to pick a couple in each category, certainly starting with the customer, certainly looking at sales, but then also looking at operations and looking at quality and looking at risk and say, to the organization, these are the two or three we're going to focus on in the next six months. And then I think that's what simplifies it for organizations. Thanks, Isaac. So something that I found interesting, it's not surprising in that the survey found that too much data is one of the biggest challenges that organizations have, followed by the limitations that we just talked about in terms of identifying what are the ideal business metrics. But a, a whopping 74% of survey respondents said, we failed to have key data available in real time, which is a big inhibitor for data-driven decision-making. Can you guys offer some advice to organizations? How can they harness this data, glean insights from it faster? Kieran, take it away. Yeah, I think uh, there are probably five steps to establishing business KPIs. And, and Lisa, your first two questions and these gentlemen's answers laid out the first two. That is define the questions that you want answers for and then identify what those data inputs would be. You know, if you've got a formula in mind, what data inputs do, do you need? The remaining three steps, one is, you know, to um, evaluate the data you've got and, and identify what's missing, you know, what do you need to then fetch? And then that fetching, you need to think about the measurement method, the frequency. Um, I think Isaac mentioned, you know, this concept of tool sprawl. We have too many tools to collect data. Um, so the measurement method and frequency is important, standardizing on tools and, and automating that collection wherever possible. And then the last step, this is really the people component of the formula. You need to identify stakeholders that will own those business KPIs and even communicate them within the organization. That human element is sometimes forgotten. It's really important. It is important. It's one of the challenges as well. Kevin, talk to us about your thoughts here. Yeah, again, uh, for sure, you've got, you, in the end, you've got the human element. You can, you can give people you, all kinds of KPIs. Uh, as Isaac said, often it's too many. You've now KPI'd the business to death and nobody can get out and, and, and do anything. That doesn't work. Um, obviously, you can't improve things till you measure them. So you have to measure it. We get that. Um, but this question of live data is interesting. 
my personal view is only certain kinds of data are interesting absolutely live in the moment. So I think people get in their mind, oh, well, if I could deploy IoT everywhere and get instantaneous access within one second to, to the amalgam of that data, I'm making up words too, that would be interesting. Are you sure that'd be interesting? I might rather analyze the last week of real, real data, really deep analysis, right? B build uh, you know, a real model around that and say, okay, for the next week, you ought to do the following. Now, I get that if you're in the high frequency stock trading business, you know, every millisecond counts, okay? But most of our businesses do not run by the millisecond, and we're not going to make a business decision, especially humans involved, in a millisecond anyway. We make business decisions based on a fair bit of data, days and weeks. So uh, this is just my own personal opinion. I think people get hung up on this, I got to have all this live data. No, you want great data analysis using AI and machine learning to evaluate as much data as you can get over whatever period of time that is, a week, a month, a year, and, and, and start making some rational decisions off of that information. I think that is how you run a business that's going to crush your competition. Good advice. Isaac, what are your thoughts on these comments? Yeah, I'm going to pair off of uh, Kevin's comments. You know, how do you chip away at this problem uh, at getting more real-time data? And I'll, I'll share two insights. First, from the top down, you know, when Star CIO works with a group of uh, a CEO and, and their executive group, you know, how are they getting their data? Well, they're getting it in a boardroom with PowerPoints, with spreadsheets behind those PowerPoints, with analysts doing a lot of number crunching. And behind all that are all the systems of record around the CRM and the ERP and all the other systems that are telling them how they're performing. And I suggest to them for a month, leave the world of PowerPoint and Excel and bring your analysts in to show you the data live in the systems, ask questions and see what it's like to work with real-time data. That first changes the perspective in terms of all the manual work that goes into homogenizing that data for them, but then they start getting used to looking at the tools where the data is actually living. So that's an exercise from the top down. From the bottom up, when we talk to the IT groups, you know, so much of our data technologies were built at a time when batch processing in our data centers was the only way to go. We ran these things overnight to move data from point A to point B. And with the cloud, with data streaming technologies, it's really a new game in town. And so it's really time for many organizations to modernize and thinking about how they're streaming data. It doesn't necessarily have to be real time. It's not really IoT, but it's really saying, I need to have my data updated on a regular basis with an SLA against it so that my teams and my uh, businesses can make good decisions around things. So let's talk now about digital transformation. We've, we've been talking about that for years. We talked a lot about in 2020, the acceleration of digital transformation for obvious reasons. But when organizations are facing this data conundrum that we talked about, this sort of data disconnect too much, can't get what we need right away, do we need it right away? How do they flip the script on that so that it doesn't become an impediment to digital transformation, but it becomes an accelerant? Kieran? You know, a, a lot of times you'll hear uh, vendors talk about technology as being the answer, right? So MI, ML, you know, my math is better than your math, et cetera. And technology is important, but it's only effective to the point at which people can actually interpret, understand, and use the data. And so I, I would put forth this notion of having data at all levels um, throughout an organization. Um, too often, what you'll see is that, I think Isaac mentioned it, you know, the data is delivered to the C-suite via PowerPoint and it's been sanitized and scrubbed, et cetera. But heck, by the time it gets to the C-suite, it's three weeks old. Data at all levels is making sure that throughout the organization, um, the right people have real-time access to data and can make actionable decisions based upon that. So I, I think that's a real vital ingredient to successful digital transformation. Kevin? Well, I like to think of digital transformation as uh, as looking at all of your relatively manual or paper-based or other processes, whatever they are throughout the organization, and saying, is this something that can now be done by, for lack of a better word, by a machine, right? And that machine could be algorithms, it could be computers, it could be humans, it could be cloud, it could be AI, it could be IoT, it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> and so... There's a reason to do that. And, and of course the basis of that 
is the data. You've got to collect data to say, this is how we've been performing. This is what we've been doing. So an example, a simple example of digitization is people doing RPA around customer support. Now you collect a lot of data on how customer support has been supporting customers. You break that into tiers and you say, here's the easiest, lowest tier. I had farmed that out to probably some other country 20 years ago or 10 years ago. Can I, even with the systems in place, can I automate that with a set of processes, robotic process automation, that digitizes that process now? Now, there still might be, you know, 20 different screens to click on and all different kinds of things, whatever it is. But can I do that? Can I do it with some chat bots? Can I do it with it? Now, I'm not going to do all the customer support that way, but I could probably do a fair bit. Can I digitize that process? Can I digitize the process? Great, great example, we all know, is insurance companies taking claims. Okay, I have a phone. Can, can I take a picture of my car that just got smashed, send it in, let AI analyze it, and frankly, do an ACH transfer within the hour? Because if it costs an insurance company on average $300 to $500, depending on who they are, to process a claim, it's cheaper to just send me the $500 than even question it. And if I did it two or three times, well, then I'm trying to steal their money and I should go to jail, right? So, so these are just, I'm, I'm giving these as examples because they're examples that everyone who's watching this would go, oh, I understand you're digitizing a process. So now when we get to much more complex processes that we're digitizing in data or hiring or, or whatever, those are a little harder to understand. But I just try to give those as like everyone understands, oh, yes, you should digitize those. Those are obvious, right? No, those are great examples. You're right. They're they're uh, relatable across the board here. Isaac, talk to me about what your thoughts are about okay, this data conundrum. How do we flip the script and leverage data access to it, insights to drive and facilitate digital transformation rather than impede it? Well, remember, you know, digital transformation is really about changing the business model, changing how you're working with customers and what markets you're going after. You're being forced to do that because of the pace digital technologies are enabling competitors to outpace you. And so we really like starting digital transformations with a vision. What does this business need to do better, differently, more of? What markets are we going to go after? What types of technologies are important? And we're going to create that vision, but we know long term planning doesn't work. We know multi-year doesn't planning doesn't work. So we're going to send our teams out on an agile journey over the next sprint, over the next quarter, and we're going to use data to give us information about whether we're heading in the right direction. Should we do more of something? Is this feature higher priority? Is there a certain customer segment that we need to pay attention to more? Is there a set of defects happening in our technology that we have to address? Is there a new competitor stealing market share? All that kind of data is what the organization needs to be looking at on a very regular basis to say, do we need to pivot what we're doing? Do we need to accelerate something? Uh, do, are we heading in the right direction? Um, should we give ourselves high fives uh, and celebrate a quick win because we've accomplished something? Because so much of transformation is what we're doing today. We're going to change what we're doing over the next three years. And then guess what? There's going to be a new set of technologies. There's going to be another disruption that we can't anticipate. And we want our team teams sitting on their toes, waiting to look at data and saying, what should we do next? That's a great segue, Isaac, into our last question, which is around culture. That's always one of those elephants in the room, right? Because so much cultural transformation is necessary, but it's incredibly difficult. So question for you guys, Karen, we'll start with you is, should do you advise leadership should really create a culture, a company-wide culture around data? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this reminds me of DevOps in, in many ways. And, um, you know, the data has to be shared at all levels and has to empower people to make decisions at their respective levels so that we're not, you know, kind of siloed in, in our knowledge or our decision making. It's through that collective intelligence that I think organizations can move forward more quickly. But they do have to change the culture. They've got to have everyone in the room. Everyone's got a, a stake in driving business success from the C-suite down to the you know individual contributor. Right, Kevin, your thoughts? You know, Karen's right, data silos, one of the biggest brick walls in all of our way, all the time. You know, SecOps says, there is no way I'm going to share that database because uh, it's got PII. Okay, well, how about if we strip the PII? Well, then that won't be good for something else. And you get in these huge arguments. And if you're not driving it from the top, 
certainly the CIO, maybe the CFO, maybe the CEO. I would argue the CEO drives it from the top because because the CEO drives company culture. And, and you know, we talk biz ops, and, and the first word of that is biz. It's the business, right? It's it's ops being driven by business goals. And, and the CEO has to set the business goals. It's not really up to the CIO to set business goals. They're setting operational goals. It's up to the CEO. So when the CEO comes out and says, our business goals are to drive up sales by this, drive down costs by this, drive up speed of product development, whatever it is, and we're going to digitize all of our processes to do that. We're going to set in KPIs. We're going to measure everything that we do, and everybody's going to work around this table. By the way, just like we did with DevOps a decade ago, right, and said, Dev, you actually have to work with ops now. And they go, those, those dangerous guys way over in that other building? We don't even know who they are. But in, in time, people realize that we're all on the same team and that if developers develop something that operations can't host and support and, and, and keep alive, it, it's junk, right? And, and we used to do that, and now we're much better at it. And whether it's DevSecOps or Dev QA Ops, whatever, all those teams working together, now we're going to spread that out and make it a bigger pie around the company. And it starts with the CEO. And when the CEO makes it a director for the company, I think we're all going to be successful. Isaac, what are your thoughts? I think we're really talking about a culture of transformation and a culture of collaboration. I mean, again, everything that we're doing now, we're going to build, we're going to learn, we're going to use data to pivot what we're doing. We're going to release a product to customers. We're going to get feedback. We're going to continue to iterate over those things. Same thing when it comes to sales, same things that, you know, the experiments that we do for marketing. What we're doing today, we're constantly learning. We're constantly challenging our assumptions. We're trying to throw out the sacred cows and what status quo because we know there's going to be another island that we have to go after and that's the transformation part the collaboration part is really you know what what you're hearing multiple teams not just dev and ops and not just data and dev but really the spectrum of business of product of stakeholders of marketing and sales working with technologists and saying look this is the things that we need to go after over these time periods and work collaboratively and iteratively around them and again the data is the foundation for this right we talk about a learning culture as part of that the data is a big part of that learning learning new skills and what new skills to learn is is part of that but when when i think about culture you know you know, what the, the things that slow down organizations is when they're not transforming fast enough or they're going in five or six different directions. They're not collaborative enough. And the data is the element in there that is an equalizer. It's what you show everybody to say, look, what we're doing today is not going to make us survive over the next three years. The data equalizer. That sounds like a that could be a movie coming out in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, thank yeah. you for walking us through some of those interesting metrics coming out of the BizOps inaugural survey. Yes, there are challenges with data. Many of them aren't surprising, but there's a lot, also a lot of tremendous opportunity. And I liked how you kind of brought it around to from a cultural perspective. It's got to start from that C-suite and to Kieran's point all the way done. I know we could keep talking, we're out of time, but we'll, we'll have to keep following. This is a very interesting topic, one that is certainly pervasive across industries. Thanks guys for sharing your insights. Thank, Thank you. you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. For Kieran Taylor, Kevin Cerace and Isaac Sokolik, I am Lisa Martin. Thanks for watching. Welcome back, Lisa Martin here, talking with Lorraine Knudsen, a CUBE alum, alumni. She's the Chief Transformation Officer at Broadcom and a founding member of the BizOps Coalition. Lorraine, I'm excited to talk to you about an, an interesting topic today. Welcome back to the program. Thank you so much. Glad so to we're going to be, we're, yeah, we're going to be talking about the pros and cons of adding a Chief Digital Officer. You say there may be some friction there, but it's going to be temporary as the benefits will be long lasting. So let's dive right in. Talk to me about what the role of a chief digital officer is. Is this something that a CIO can take on? In some organizations, I think the CIO is taking on this role and it's primarily um, focusing on what we're calling the digitization of the organization. So it's across more than just IT though. So it's looking at what kind of digital marketing should you be doing? What are your competitors doing? How can you um, 
make the most bang for your buck essentially across your entire organization. So it also includes parts that generally haven't been included in digital transformations like your legal team or your finance team and the interactions with them. Can your contracts be digitized? Can they be made more efficient and more automated, right? So it's, it's looking at the entire organization both internally and externally and looking at the strategy for how do you accomplish that and how do you truly make your organization as effective as it can be? Is this person almost like a bridge between the different lines of business and IT to get that external internal focus? Yes. Yeah, many people in IT don't have that business knowledge. That's a really good point. Um, and so this person will need to have not only business knowledge, but technical knowledge so they can essentially uh, translate, right? The, the verbiage that is used in the different organizations and the jargon that's used um, to make it, to make a, the, the understanding between the two of what's needed um, more smooth, you know, the communication more smooth within the organization. Um, also focusing on customer value and making sure that, that both sides are saying the same, you know, when they use the same words, they're saying the same things. So doing that translation and that organization across um, the entire uh, company. Looking at it from that holistic perspective, you know, I know that the BizOps Coalition survey also showed that something that we hear that digital transformation isn't just about the technology. It's got to be all of the factors coming together aligned on business outcomes, right. aligned on what's the impact and the value to the customer. How is the chief digital officer role going to facilitate that? Uh, not just understanding, but putting in practice that digital transformation is not just about technology. Well, yeah, 95% of companies are confirming that, that right now they're focusing much more on business outcomes than just on technology. And so there really is that need to, to you know, what does that mean? Right. When you're focusing on business outcomes, it often includes a lot of technology, but it's, um, you know, there's a different path to take to make sure that you're focusing on your customer outcomes. Um, there's a lot of organizations that are looking at their apps and realizing their customers find the most value when they never have to use them. So how do you how do you accomplish that? Right. That's not adding new features in. That's not doing something new um, for the customer other than. Making, it, making sure everything runs so smoothly that they never have to access your app. You know, we're running into that with a lot of business organizations like uh, insurance companies or banking, um, phone, you know, telco companies, things like that, where um, people really don't want to use the, the products you're creating for them if they don't have to. Right, adoption is always something that we talk about that can be uh, a, a KPI, but also a challenge. One of the things that I noticed that information that, that Broadcom provided was that Gartner says in the next 12 months, 67% of organizations are going to be looking at hiring a chief digital officer. Let's have you talk us through, what are some of the, the forcing functions behind that? Obviously the last year has been quite, filled with quite a bit of uncertainty, but we look back a couple of decades, there wasn't talk of a chief digital officer. So why this, uh, why is there such a big uptick in the need for this role? Well, it's interesting because Gartner originally talked about the chief digital officer in about 2010 to 2012 timeframe where they were talking about the need for it. And it was a lot of, um, I think fast moving companies and the companies that really have made a lot of advancements in their effectiveness and their customer um, centricity have really grabbed onto this concept, whether they've called it a chief digital officer or not. But in the last year, it's forced everyone to have a digital footprint in the market. If you'll notice, even your local uh, restaurants that are family owned now have some sort of way to order their food digitally. Right, so we're we're digitizing the entire thing, and the and COVID has really um, required every company to look at much more how they can do things electronically. Any type of um, you know digitization, whether it's like I've said before, the marketing, or even how do you handle all of your um, contracts when there's no uh, in-person signature and no you know fax machines to send things back and forth. Right, it's all of making sure that all of that's secure and protected. So it's going across the entire organization. And that's really creating that need for somebody to be able to look at how your company can do all of those different things. Because quite frankly, the CIO already has a day job, right? Your chief marketing officer already has a day job. So trying to look at how to be really innovative in these areas 
um, creates a, a gap, right? And people aren't finding that extra time to be able to do that and to look at how to be um, really streamlining their organizations and taking that innovation in with both internal and external um, viewpoints. Well, I'd be imagine you mentioned, you know, the CIO, the CMO, the CFO having day jobs, but also one of the things that sounds to me like is important for this CDO role is to have objectivity, to be able to rise above all the different functions, the different technology stocks and probably silos that are there and really look holistically across the organization. So talk to me about some of the skills that are really required from the chief digital officer. Is this someone that needs to have both an IT background and a business background, does it matter? Um, I think as long as they have the knowledge of either side, the where they came from isn't going to matter, but you're going to, the, the problem is going to be finding the people with those dual skill sets, right? Because you're going to need somebody that can understand your business and your technology side to marry the two together. But they're also going to need to understand all the intricacies of the legal aspects that need to go into creating your products or the financial aspects of tracking what happens with your products. Um, so they're, they're really going to need to be um, not only very well educated and uh, have a lot of experience, but the other thing they're going to need is that emotional empathy and that ability to work with everybody in the organization. Essentially, if they do their job right, they'll be coming in and working with every other vice president or chief in your organization. So they'll be helping to influence all of those people. And that can create a lot of conflict at first because you're having somebody else come in to give the CIO insights into how they can innovate um, technologically or to give the chief marketing officer information on new ways that they can do their jobs, that they can digitize the marketing um, to be more effective and the right frame of mind to be able to do that. Um, you know, hiring is going to be another place where these people will have a large imprint because they're going to need the knowledge to be able to uh, interview all across the board for people that can help them get these new innovations into place. For example, if marketing needs to expand into more of a digital footprint to actually get the um, the imprints that they need, right? How do you interview for that when, as a marketing leader, you've never run a digital part, a digital organization before? So it's it's really having the ability to partner with every other department in the organization and um, work with them, which, you know, to your point, that can cause some conflicts to start off with, but in the long run, it'll, it should be well worth it. Well, it sounds like that friction is probably unavoidable in the beginning as this person really works to understand all of the inner machinations of the organization and really identify what's best for the overall business. I, I, you mentioned empathy, and I think that's something that we've heard a lot about in the last year as leaders really needing to adopt that. And it sounds like this role for it to be such a catalyst of IT and business element as it sounds like it really can be, that empathetic gene really needs to be turned on pretty high, I think. A hundred percent, right? They, they need to be able to be really um, understanding of the organization and the other people that they're working with, that those people do have a great bit of knowledge about the company that they're joining, right, generally, and that they'll understand their jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. But the innovation parts, right, is where the chief digital officer will come in. And if the chief digital officer does this well, they can actually have a really big impact on the corporate culture as well, which is a huge area that people are focusing on these days, especially as every employee is remote. So it's a, it's a big job and a big ask, and it's gonna be really important for companies to hire the person with the best fit for their organization in this new role. You mentioned culture, and that's something that is imperative, but digital transformations won't be successful without the right cultural transformation. But that's a easier said than done, especially for yes. organizations that have been around a while and they're so used to the way they've done business for decades that it's hard to change that mindset. But it sounds like the chief digital officer role should be one that is an influencer of that cultural change. How do you see them being able to do that within a you know, stodgy legacy institution? What are some of the things that they would be able to unlock? 
they should be able to re-energize portions of the company, right? If you're bringing in innovative ideas into a company that has had a, had some difficulty hiring, right? There's there's a lot of companies that before the pandemic hit were um, only starting to look at agile practices and things because quite frankly, they couldn't hire anyone out of college to work there and they were afraid most of their workforce would um, retire out. So they're trying to get those people that want to be innovative, the, the high, um, the people that, that graduated top of their class, you're going to need the, the organization to change. And this is a perfect example of somebody that can come in and be a catalyst for all of that. So if they're coming up with new innovative ideas, if your marketing department wasn't transforming into a highly digital marketing department, they can come help invigorate that, right? And come up with a plan to get people in, but also to train the people that are there that do want to learn these new skills in order to bring the whole organization along with them. And I think they can have a, a huge impact if they and get those, um, those innovative culture cycles changing. I'm curious if you think that, you know, given the last year and the amount of uncertainty that the pandemic has brought um, to the market, to the economy, now some of the challenges that leaders say, we're still going to have similar challenges in 2021. We still have a good percentage of our workforce remote. Is the, is the role that the chief digital officer can play, is that potentially going to help companies really, is it going to help make a difference between those companies that really not just survive this time, but thrive like the winners versus the losers of tomorrow? I think it can. Right, and a lot of this is going to be how the people that hire in the chief digital officer and how much that team is willing to work with them. Um, one of the things that we notice is the companies that do advance their culture a lot and advance in their um, customer centricity, the leadership level of the organization acts as a team as much as they expect the frontline crews to act as teams. So you've got to be working together and that goes all the way through, right? Your HR departments can't be incenting one group to work against another. You can't incent two people to have a, a goal, you know, to reach a goal in a different way um, and incent them differently so that they end up working against each other, right? This has to start being a real collaborative effort and it, it'll end up impacting the entire organization. But it's those companies that start looking at their leadership organization as a team where they're all playing to make the same goals to make their customers the most successful they can be, that's when you really start getting those changes and you really see a chief uh, digital officer having an impact versus those organizations where, you know, they'll be on the job for two to three years and, and it'll just go away because they've, you know, fought against themselves and uh, right. not formed that team culture. The impact is, can be tremendous from what I'm hearing. Yes. When we think about, digital transformation, you know, people, processes, technology, that culture that's so important. We're also talking about that in the context of how do organizations use all their data and make the most sense of it as more data sources become available, data is coming in faster. How does the chief digital officer align with all of the data folks within an organization so that they can all have access to the right information to make data-driven decisions that are really for internal and externally looking benefits. Right, um, they can help make sense of the data that the company's collecting. Um, one of the main things we're hearing right now is a lot of organizations are collecting a ton of data and they're either you know, having some organization that creates metrics out of it and that group just doesn't know really what the business does. They're relatively new to the business as a lot of data organizations are. So they go grab standard metrics and just provide, you know, shove as many metrics out. That's their output point, right? Where they get brownie points for every metric they create. And so we're hearing from a lot of leaders that, that they're getting literally hundreds of metrics a month and they have no idea what they're supposed to be doing with them or what this data is supposed to be showing them. And that's really of no benefit to anybody, right? It's a waste of time all through the organization. So the chief digital officer, again, will be looking at what are the right business metrics to be tracking for that business and be working with those data officers to get the right innovation in so that you can see how well you're transforming, how well your company's actually doing, how much your customers actually do like what you're creating and the impact of the changes that you're making. So another thing we're, we're being asked a lot of is, you know, I'm funding things and I'm being told they'll provide my customers value, but when they get released, I have no idea if they are. 
right? And the chief data officer will help be putting all the metrics that tie that in, ensuring telemetry gets built in so that they've got the, the metrics that you need to truly run your business well. And so again, that'll be another part of the organization that the chief digital officer would be working with. Along with the CIO, they'll be working with the data organizations as well. Well, there's so much opportunity that the chief digital officer role can deliver and unlock value in an organi organization as you've talked about. It'll be interesting, Lorraine, to see what happens in the next 12 months. Do we see what Gartner is predicting? 67% of companies are going to be adopting this role. Uh, I'm curious to see what the BizOps Coalition finds in the next year or so, but thank you for sharing this insight. This definitely sounds like a role where every day will be interesting, unique, and not boring. 